Good morning to you at 6 a.m. We begin with breaking news in Chula Vista, where an investigation is currently underway after a woman's body was found. Police made the discovery just after midnight on 2nd Avenue and Shasta Street. Officers have removed the body. Investigators are questioning people in the neighborhood. We will, of course, continue to watch the story closely and we'll bring you new information just as soon as we get it. Unrest continues in Kenosha, Wisconsin this morning as protesters march through the streets for the fourth night. They are protesting the police shooting of Jacob Blake, and we are learning new information this morning about the investigation. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Wisconsin's attorney general says the police officer who shot Blake was Kenosha officer Rustin Shesky. Police say Blake told officers he had a knife and that one was recovered from the driver's side floorboard. Officers also tried to take Blake into custody using a taser, but the attempt was unsuccessful. Also, regarding the two people killed during Tuesday night's protest, police have arrested 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, who is accused of opening fire on protesters with a semi-automatic rifle. President Trump is sending in federal officers, the governor also deploying 500 additional members of the National Guard. And several major league sports teams, including our own Padres, are standing in solidarity of the protests, bringing current games to a halt right now. News 8's Chris Grow live outside Petco Park with a closer look at their message. And it's right on that building behind you there, right, Chris? And good morning, Eric. Yeah, racial uh, inequality and obviously police brutality a focus as a cause and an issue here uh, for a lot of teams across the entire sports landscape. And you can see right there uh, with that picture of Jackie Robinson, diversity, equality and unity, something that is especially now uh, that message being spread here uh, across uh, the country in wake of the shooting of Jacob Blake and others. Now, we saw that reaction was raw and palpable in many communities, but here's how Tony Gwynn Jr. reacted to that emotional plea from LA Clippers coach Doc Rivers that has since gone viral. That emotion is, is real. Um, it's an emotion that I know everybody in my household has. Um, every one of my African-American friends have right now. Part of you feels guilty because my oldest is 12, my youngest is five. It's like you just snatched the innocence from them before you should have to. And that's the tough part. Now the Padres released a short statement as well after the Mariners boycotted their game with the Padres yesterday, uh, saying, quote, we understand the Mariners' decision to postpone tonight's game and we support the players' efforts to use their platform to bring awareness to the very serious issue of racial injustice impacting our country today. Now, the Mariners made the decision first to boycott this game, and they have the most black players on their roster in Major League Baseball. In fact, Mariners D. Gordon wrote on Twitter, instead of watching us, we hope people will focus on the things more important than sports that are happening. Now, we also saw similar boycotts happen in the MLS, the LA Galaxy, and Seattle Sounders postponed their game. And in the WNBA, players sat out games there as well. In a powerful moment, several players took a knee on the court with locked arms and shirts that spelled out Jacob Blake's name. On the back, you could see seven bullet wounds. In the NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks were the first team to boycott their playoff game with the Orlando Magic, and they had this to say as a team. Despite the overwhelming plea for change, there has been no action. So our focus today cannot be on basketball. When we take the court and represent Milwaukee and Wisconsin, we are expected to play at a high level, give maximum effort, and hold each other accountable. We hold ourselves to that standard, and in this moment, we are demanding the same from lawmakers and law enforcement. Now, in total, three playoff games in the NBA were postponed. In lieu of those games, players and coaches met inside the Orlando bubble to discuss what to do next. That, according to the athletic. Now during that meeting, Lakers and Clippers players voted to end the season in protest, but they were the only teams. And according to the athletic as well, Lakers superstar LeBron James reportedly told the group that he wants owners to be more involved and to take more action. Now back out here live, the next step here for the MLB is for the Padres and the Mariners to play a double header today. Now again, we have heard uh, that obviously this boycott occurred yesterday, but what further action 
uh, could be taken remains to be seen. Remember, the messaging behind the boycotting and not playing of these games is they want the focus to be on uh, what they feel is obviously the racial injustice going on in the country and then obviously what they feel uh, is a, a lack of justice in the shooting of Jacob Blake. And so they want the focus and the attention to be on that case and similar cases uh, going on across the country instead of the games being played uh, on national television. Eric Stella. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. Vice President Mike Pence addressing the unrest in Kenosha in his speech last night at the Republican National Convention. Pence also officially accepted his nomination for the Republican vice presidential nominee. So with gratitude for the confidence President Donald Trump has placed in me, the support of our Republican Party, and the grace of God, I humbly accept your nomination to run and serve as Vice President of the United States. Several topics were discussed in his speech from coronavirus response to defending the Trump administration's record. Pence warned of rising lawlessness and violence under a Democratic White House, alluding to the unrest in Kenosha. President Trump was among those who attended Pence's speech at Baltimore's Fort McHenry. Many speakers expressed strong support for the president's law and order proposals. The RNC culminates tonight with President Trump officially accepting the Republican nomination in a speech delivered from the South Lawn of the White House. About 1,500 people are expected to be on hand at the White House to hear President Trump's acceptance speech. The Trump campaign says they will all be tested for coronavirus before they're admitted. And you can watch live coverage of the final night of the Republican National Convention tonight at 7 right here on CBS 8, as well as on CBS 8.com and our News 8 app. You can catch all the highlights from the convention on News 8 at 10, simulcasting on CBS 8 and the CW San Diego. And now to the very latest on the coronavirus. County officials reported 8,300 new COVID tests with 228 new positive cases, making for a 3% positive rate. The 14-day rolling average for positive tests is now at 3.6%. Three more deaths were reported for a total of 668. In the meantime, SDSU has now also reported two new cases in students living off campus. They say the cases are unrelated to their campus. The university says the students have not interacted with the campus and are following isolation and quarantine protocols. Well, a state senator from San Diego County has also tested positive for COVID-19. We're talking about Senator Brian Jones from Santee saying he has the virus. Jones represents the 38th district encompassing much of East County and parts of North County. He did not say when he was tested or if he was showing any symptoms. The Senate was scheduled to hold a floor session yesterday, but that was canceled. And Governor Newsom has unveiled a new ambitious plan to double the state's COVID-19 testing just in time for flu season. This promises a decrease in the total turnaround time as well as the cost. So here is what Governor Newsom is saying. Under this new partnership with the medical diagnostic company Perkins, uh, Perkin Elmer, California will increase its current testing capacity to a quarter million tests per day. This will leverage the state's market muscle to bring the cost down to less than $31 per test. As the cost decreases, so will the wait times to get results guaranteed under the contract to be no more than 48 hours. Each and every day is a precious day in terms of the test results. And the governor highlighted that this new partnership will include at no extra cost influenza testing as we head into flu season. We will have more on how experts are warning about the flu season amid coronavirus. That's coming up in the next half hour. Eric. All right, let's get your morning rush here at 6, 10 a.m. The massive fire aboard the USS Bonham Richard last month is now under investigation as a possible case of arson. Multiple sources confirm a sailor is a potential suspect. The motive still unclear. The multi-agency firefighter firefight also called on 400 sailors in nearby ships to help put out the fire days later. 
63 sailors and one firefighter was hurt. Uh, I should say 63 sailors and firefighters were hurt in this. The U.S. Navy released a statement saying, quote, the Navy will not comment in an ongoing investigation to protect the integrity of the investigative process and all those involved. We have nothing to announce at this time. Sentencing is scheduled today for the man who led police on a chase in a stolen car, then tried to run down a police officer in Imperial Beach. Alfonso Flores faces up to 19 years in prison. So this happened last November. The sentencing is scheduled to begin at 1.30 this afternoon at the Central Courthouse downtown. The chief of the La Mesa Police Department is officially retiring today. Earlier this month, the department made the announcement during a town hall addressing last May's protests. The city says Walt Vasquez's retirement was planned earlier, but he decided to remain as chief to guide La Mesa through the coronavirus pandemic. Stella? Well, we are tracking Hurricane Laura for you right now. We want to take a live look from New Orleans this morning. We're learning that it is now moving through Louisiana as a Category 2 storm. Look at those gray clouds. And uh, it's bringing dangerous winds and rain, as well as concerns of a storm. We heard when it made landfall, the winds were as strong as 150 miles per hour. So tornado warnings also in effect throughout parts of the state. Interstate 10 was also shut down overnight because of fears of flooding. This is very powerful. Courtney Zabowski is in Galveston, Texas with all the details. Take a look. Hurricane Laura slammed Louisiana and Texas overnight, coming ashore as a powerful Category 4 storm. The National Hurricane Center warned of a so-called unsurvivable storm surge. This is a dangerous situation. This is a dangerous amount of water, 20 foot above the ground. It could cover houses. It could cover um, just all sorts of areas, and that's why it becomes unsurvivable. Local officials along the Gulf Coast put in mandatory evacuation orders that covered over half a million people. Mass destruction. I mean, water surgery could take out stuff that you'd never believe. All we got to do is hope. Hope. Hope and pray. Yeah, that's for sure. Paul Frazier and the Gulf State's dive and rescue team expect to be conducting swift water rescues today. It's grown to become a monster storm. Uh, it's an unpredictable storm. We've been looking at it change in, 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 in degrees of severity. Ahead of the storm, residents in Louisiana and here in Texas along the coast rushed inland to escape the life-threatening situations. I literally just grabbed that basket and threw it in the car and just took off. Derek Laverne ended up near Dallas, but his mind remains at home. The re regular rainstorms that we have in Beaumont flood us out, and we up underwater. So the fact that a uh, category four that might just wipe us out. The storm is expected to move through Louisiana and into Arkansas before turning right on its way to Virginia this weekend. Courtney Zabowski, CBS News, Galveston, Texas. And Heather, as we get some daylight, we'll get to see more of that damage, but Laura is still a category two. It's still a really strong storm system and it still has maximum sustained winds of about 100 miles per hour. So that is not good news for people living in that part of the country. It came on shore, as you just heard, as a cat four with maximum sustained winds at 150 miles per hour. So you can only imagine the wind damage. And now we are looking at the storm surge. It's already up to nine feet in parts of Louisiana. So flooding will be a huge problem. Let's take a look a little closer here exactly where the storm system is right now. As you can see, any Anywhere that's shaded in red and the orange color that you're, that you're seeing on the screen, those are the areas that will sustain the most damage. It's 80 miles south of Shreveport, Louisiana. It will blow through Shreveport and then start heading off in a more northwesterly, uh, easterly direction, I should say. So you can see there, it'll brush by Memphis, head off toward Kentucky, and then as we get into the weekend, it'll become post-tropical status. But nevertheless, it's the storm surge I'm most concerned about, and it's something that doesn't necessarily show up on video when you take a look at that. You are more impressed by the winds and the rain, but it's the flooding and somebody just shoving seawater on the land that will create the most problems with this. So let's take a look here as we kind of zoom in a little bit closer at uh, where we're noticing those winds and you can see huge problem out there. We're going to continue to keep you updated on Laura. Now that it's daylight out there, we're getting more cameras on the ground. We'll be able to get a better view of exactly what's going on. Time now 615. I'll send it back to you. 
Okay, Heather, thank you for that. And here in California, we're dealing with hundreds of wildfires. Some good news, though, in Northern California, some residents were able to return to their homes, but it's not over yet. We're going to have the latest on the fire conditions. Plus, a family member of victims of a deadly bluff collapse in North County now taking legal action. And why experts are warning about fake treatments and testing kits for COVID-19, where they're being sold and how to protect yourself.